everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm your host for today's fourth Field to Fork webinar for the season. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. And if you missed any of the last ones, they're all archived along with many others from the previous years. This is the eighth year that we've done the series, and we're really glad you joined us today. The next slide shows the upcoming webinars. So check those out. We hope you will join us for those as well. And the next slide shows our webinar controls. And because we have a lot of you joining us and we're really happy about that, we invite you to post your questions and comments in the chat, just like many of the people right now are telling us where they're from. So that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna practice finding and using the chat. Uh, Please type your city and state and greeting that you want to leave us. And we will ignore the Q&A box. We're not going to use the questions and answers. We're going to go ahead and use the chat today. So you're from all over the place, so that's great. The next slide provides an acknowledgement for the funding. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I will ask all of you to complete a short online survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, we will continue to provide prizes to the lucky winners of the random drawings. But we need you to leave your complete address on the follow-up form, including your city, state, and zip code. So watch for that survey and please take it if you wouldn't mind. So the next slide is our final welcome and our introduction to today's speaker. And I'm very happy to have Andrew Thostenson joining us today. He is responsible for administering the training and certification of private and commercial pesticide applicators across North Dakota. He's both the Cooperative Extension Service Pesticide, Pesticide Coordinator and his organization is the state lead agency for certification and training in North Dakota. Andrew has both a bachelor's and a master's degree in plant sciences from the University of Idaho. He has four years of experience as a county extension agent in Washington State and North Dakota. He owned and operated a seed and crop management consulting company in the Pacific Northwestern United States for 10 years, and he's been in his current position with NDSU for 26 years. Andrew is a former president and current fellow with the American Association of Pesticide Safety Educators. He's the past chair of EPA Certification and Training Assessment Group. So you can see he's well qualified to talk to us about today's topic. So Welcome, Andrew, and I'm going to dim my, my video and hand it over to you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. And we're talking about pesticides, my favorite topic. So um, what could be better on a Wednesday afternoon than talking about that? Well, maybe not so much when it comes to pesticides, but We'll do our best to try and make it interesting and also useful for all of you out there across the country. I'm going to go ahead and mute my micro or my uh, video as well, so it's not a distraction, and that way you'll be able to just focus in on my slides. Let's just talk a little bit about what we're not going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about whether pesticides are good or bad. I'm not going to talk about whether organic pesticides are safer than conventional pesticides that you might purchase in the local hardware store. I'm going to assume that all of you that are listening to this thing are making a decision at some point to use pesticides or you're at least interested in using pesticides or managing pests in your garden situation. And so I want to raise with you some. Uh, issues and concerns and and give you some tools and, and information to be able to use those pesticides appropriately. So one of the things that we're going to talk about on a number of different uh, slides today is, is, you know, what should gardeners not know about pesticides? And I think it's because we've had a 
over the years, a lot of Madison Avenue uh, television, commercial pizzazz that have, that have really placed pesticides um, in a situation that's just completely unrealistic. I'm going to play this 1970s vintage television commercial, uh, and, and you'll get an appreciation for what I'm talking about. To all those people who've always wanted a beautiful yard, but don't have time to work at it, your day has come. Because now there's a revolutionary line of bug and weed killers. There's never been anything like it before. New Johnson Yardmaster. Take this Yardmaster lawn weed killer for broadleaf weeds. Like all our yard products, it's pre-mixed. There's no mixing or measuring. All I have to do is hook it to a hose and spray. It sprays out a foam that shows where you're covered, so you can't miss. <laughs> you weeds don't stand a chance. New Johnson Yardmaster Lawn Weed Killer, Insect Killer, Crabgrass Preventer, and Vegetable Garden Insect Killer. When you hook up with Yardmaster, the bugs and weeds don't stand a chance. Yard yeah, looks terrific. They must have a gardener. You'll find New Johnson Yardmaster at your local lawn and garden dealer. So I look at that and I say to myself, hey, this whole pesticide thing is just a snap. You know, those weeds don't have a chance and uh, all you have to do is hook it up and spray. And in some respects, there may be a kernel of truth in that, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Some of the things that we've, we've seen in the pesticide realm are what I would consider to be just completely ridiculous and, and <laughs> You know, if you're a pesticide specialist, you really laugh a lot when you see certain commercials. This is from 1996, and uh, I'll just let the commercial speak for itself. Weeding again, eh, Bob? Huh? Why not do it once, do it right? Why is your head in the ground? I'm going to watch Roundup kill these roots. Hey, this is Spike's area. Bob, Roundup can be used where kids and pets will play and breaks down into natural materials. Since Roundup kills the root, what's not coming back, Bob? The weed? You betcha, Bob. Come on down and take a peek. Can I square one? Sure, Bob. That Bob, he's something else, but that dog, well, that dog is a very impressive dog indeed. It, you know, it, it kind of makes trivial some of the more serious things associated with pesticides and I don't I don't want to laugh off concerns about uh, pesticides because that's my business and I take it very seriously and I want you all to take it seriously as well so many of the comments that I'm going to make today actually come from a very close colleague of mine uh, at Purdue University and his name is Fred Whitford. Him and I have been at this game going on uh, 25 plus years. And he came up with a really fine publication that goes through an incredible array of issues and concerns, ideas, suggestions on how to use pesticides in a garden situation. So um, I'm gonna put this QR code up and that will take you to this publication. And you can download that as a PDF file, 60 some pages. So it's it's quite lengthy. Uh, Julie, I believe, is is going to make that available uh, to folks on the Field to Pork website. Um, but if you want, go ahead and uh, take a, a, a scan of that and it should bounce you right to that publication. I'm gonna make a few more comments from our North Dakota State University publication. And this, interestingly enough, had its origins back in the uh, late 1990s. Uh, my predecessor, Greg Dahl, worked with uh, Julie on putting that uh, publication together. It's still quite relevant, and that's why I'm offering it up to you. It's just a, a couple of pages, uh, nothing too terribly complicated, but it just goes through some of the basics of using pesticides. And that QR code 
will take you to uh, the landing page so that you can download that publication. Like I said, it's not terribly complicated. It's not uh, all that fancy and exciting like Fred's, but I do think that will give you a handful of ideas on how to use pesticides appropriately. So no talk about pesticides would be complete without talking about pesticides generally. What are they and what are they not? So pesticides are uh, uh, chemical compounds usually that are designed to, to kill, control, um, or mitigate pests. And there are specific types of pesticides um, the triazine one that you see there is an insecticide. It's specifically designed to kill insect pests on people's lawns. The Roundup one is a herbicide, and it's specifically designed to control weeds um, in a lawn. The disease control one uh, controls a, has a fungicide in it and it is designed to control diseases in the garden and on roses. Interestingly enough, a number of different pesticides out there are actually disinfectants. Lorox is one of them. That's actually a pesticide. That's also the same stuff that uh, you would find in a uh, swimming pool situation to keep algae and bacteria down. Uh, rodent killers, uh, these are rodenticides uh, used on the landscape. And then, interestingly enough, they're packaging multiple products and multiple classes of pesticides together in two- and three-way mixes. And that three-way mix includes a fungicide and, a, and an insecticide in it. So pesticide is a generic term. And then we have more specific ones. And they are all designed to control, destroy, or repel destructive pests or germs, rodents, disease, weeds, insects. In general, pesticides are designed to improve the quality of our food supply or to prevent disease or to just make our lawns look nice. Um, or maybe to keep flies down in our house, or to con control mice in our home. All of those uh, pesticides have different properties and uses and pests um, that they're designed to control. I just want to emphasize that all pesticides have risks, just as driving to the grocery store has risks. Uh, walking across the street has a risk. So every pesticide applicator, and it doesn't matter whether you are a home gardener or a commercial applicator applying many, many thousands of acres, you're responsible for making sure that that pesticide is kept on the target and done so in a way that does not create uh, problems for humans, pets, livestock, wildlife, or the environment generally. When we talk about pesticides, we really break them into two broad categories. These are restricted use, and these can only be bought and sold by people who've been properly certified to do so. So these, these people are trained, they have to pass examinations, and then they obtain a certificate, and that entitles them to be able to use restricted use pesticides. Only about I'm guessing seven to 10% of all the pesticides that we have out there are restricted. A good number of them are what we call general use. And another way of describing it is, is they are not restricted. And so generally they can be bought and sold and used by people who don't have a certification. Uh, these are the things that you can buy in the big box stores the things that you can buy uh, on the internet without a certificate. Um, these things can be bought at the local hardware store or even at the local co-op. 
and you don't need to have a certificate to purchase them or use them. Now, most pesticides sold in this country have to be registered with the Environmental Protection Agency. They are the overriding regulatory body that registers all pesticides in this country. Now, there are some exceptions. There are some pesticides that are considered so low risk that the EPA does not bother to uh, have them registered. However, that doesn't mean that the states can't require registration for all pesticides. And in North Dakota, and I'm fairly confident that Minnesota is the same way, it doesn't matter whether it's a low risk pesticide that EPA doesn't register or a highly toxic restricted use pesticide, everything needs to be registered with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. And I believe the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, if they're gonna be offered for sale or used in our respective states. And here is a database that you can go to if you want to look up a particular pesticide. And you can search by a whole variety of different search terms. If you know the actual product or if you know the company, uh, if you know what the active ingredient is, uh, if you know what the EPA registration number is, you can look it up here in the North Dakota Department of Agriculture Pesticide Database. And it includes about 140 or 50,000 different entries. So that QR code will bounce you to their website and you can look up pesticides to your heart's content. There's also a specific restricted use product list down in the, in the very bottom there on the left. So if you just want to look up restricted use materials, you can look them up that way. So the label is actually the one that tells you whether that product is restricted or not. This happens to be an extraordinarily toxic insecticide that we use to control insect pests in things like field corn or seed corn or sugar beets, or grain sorghum. Um, this would require somebody to have a proper certificate to purchase it, to sell it, or to use it. So a restricted use pesticide is gonna say so right across the top of the first page of the pesticide label. On the other hand, and I wanna emphasize this, many of our pesticides, Probably 93% or more don't have any restricted use statement. And the Trimec label is a perfect example of that. Trimec is a uh, widely used product to control broadleaf weeds in lawns. And Trimec does not have a restricted chemical statement. Now I wanna play you a very brief video clip on some of the major components of the pesticide label. This was developed by a friend of mine, Carol Ramsey Black from Washington State University. You can see the entire video if you go to that QR code. Um, Carol has about a 20 or 25 minute video there. And I'm only gonna show you about four or five minutes and it's gonna highlight some of the major aspects of the pesticide label. Let's examine what information is listed on a label and what it all means. Every pesticide product is often referred to by two different names. The brand name is the manufacturer's name for the product. They'll usually list the brand name first and largest, so you'll remember it and buy the product again. The active ingredient is the actual chemical that controls the pest. For instance, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup Weed and Grass Killer, which is the company's brand name for this herbicide. All labels have a signal word. 
This is an instant indicator of the product's toxicity and its potential risk to humans. Pesticide toxicity occurs in two ways. Products are either corrosive or irritating, or they cause normal physiological processes in our bodies to malfunction. Following is a discussion of all four signal words and their meanings, listed from most dangerous to least. This is very important. Products with danger poison along with a skull and crossbones symbol are highly toxic and deadly at low doses. Danger, all by itself, without the word poison, indicates that the product is corrosive and can cause irreversible eye damage or severe skin injury. Warning products are either moderately toxic to our body systems or can cause moderate eye or skin irritation. Caution products are either slightly toxic to our body systems or may cause slight eye or skin irritation. Any products containing these signal words require special care when applying, even those that are not pesticides. You may be surprised at the number of household products that use signal words on their labels. Look in your garage, laundry cabinet, or under the kitchen sink and evaluate the potential hazard of chemicals stored within these easily accessible places. Automobile products like antifreeze or window washer fluid often carry a danger poison signal word, while dish soap often displays warning or caution. Next, under the signal word is a section entitled Precautionary Statements. Precautionary statements further identify potential hazards and recommend ways to minimize or avoid risks. Types of precautionary statements include hazards to humans and domestic animals, environmental hazards, and physical or chemical hazards. Under the hazards to humans and domestic animals statement, you will find the signal word repeated with information indicating if the product poses a risk to your mouth, skin, lungs, or eyes. These routes of entry must be protected and the label will tell you exactly what clothing and equipment are required to safely apply the pesticide. Laundering instructions are included as well. If a label does specify certain clothing or safety equipment, be safe and follow those warnings. These are not suggestions, they're instructions, so treat them as gospel. Even if the label doesn't specify any protective clothing or equipment, it's always a good idea to wear long pants, a long sleeve shirt, shoes or boots, and waterproof gloves. If the product is a dust or a powder, wear eye protection and a dust mask to protect your eyes and lungs. At the very least, eye protection will keep you from splashing pesticides into your eyes while mixing. The label also contains information about environmental concerns, such as the possibility of harming fish, bees, and other organisms. It lets you know if the product could leach into groundwater or drift away from the area where you're applying the pesticide. These statements should concern you because you want to be sure you can apply the product without causing damage to the environment. Make sure you heed all label precautions. Protect yourself, protect others, protect the environment. As I mentioned, that's about a 20 or 25 minute uh, video presentation and I just wanted to pull out a snippet. So if you want to see the entire presentation, you can find it at that QR code. Now this is a little uh, bit more general tips for applying pesticides. I mean, we could spend an entire day talking about different ways and means of applying pesticides and the different things that we should think about when it comes to uh, pesticide safety and stewardship. But all we're trying to do here today is to just give you a handful of ideas uh, for you to think about when you're working with pesticides. This was developed by the Pesticide Steward Alliance about four or five years ago. It's a very short video clip. You take that QR code, it will take you to that particular uh, video clip. The Pesticide Stewardship Alliance is actually a collaboration between pesticide educators uh, with land grant universities, uh, regulatory agencies like state departments of agriculture, and pesticide manufacturers or registrants. So 
They have an organization called the Pesticide Stewardship Alliance. And I'm just going to offer up this little video clip for you to, uh, to think about some of the issues associated with applying pesticides in a home situation. Always read your product label and follow all label directions regarding the mixing and application of your products. The product label will tell you where you can use the product, at what rate to mix the product into water, and what pests the product will control. The product label also tells you what protective equipment and clothing you need to use and wear when applying or handling the product. Label directions are legal requirements that must be followed when using the product. Before you apply, know where the sensitive areas near where you plan to apply your product are located. These sensitive areas could include nearby gardens, schools, vineyards, creeks, ponds, etc. Know which way the wind is blowing. Apply your product when there is positive wind movement away from any nearby sensitive areas. It takes only a moment to check wind direction online using your computer or mobile phone. There are a variety of mobile phone apps that can tell you important pre-application information, such as wind direction and speed. Keep your spray nozzles as low to the ground as possible while ensuring proper product coverage. If the spray nozzles are too high, more of your product may be carried away from the application area and could possibly damage nearby sensitive areas. In addition, because your product isn't reaching the problem area, you may not get optimal efficiency and performance out of your product. Keep the spray pressure low on your sprayer. Lower pressure makes bigger spray droplets, which drop to your target faster. High pressure spraying creates smaller droplets, which can be carried away from the target spray location more easily. These are general guidelines to improve the accuracy and performance of your home pesticide application. All right. So this here is what we call general tips for how not to apply pesticides. And this was actually developed in the 1970s by a province in Australia to educate homeowners on using pesticides properly. And it's called Green Fingers. And it, the first time I saw this video clip, I, I thought it was a parody, but the more I looked at it and the more I studied it, I realized that it wasn't a parody at all. The, uh, the people who put this together really thought that they were doing a great job explaining to people how to apply pesticides and how to not do it in a bad way. So what I want you to do over the next minute and a half as you observe this 1970s vintage clip is to identify all the things that you see wrong about the way they are applying those pesticides based on your experience, based on what you've already heard, and based on what you've read or know about pesticide use. And I think one of the things that you're gonna be uh, shocked about is the number of problems there are with this particular video. So let's go with it, and then we'll talk about some of the problems on the backside, okay? Hello again. Most of us at times can become exasperated when weeds take over parts of the garden. Chemicals have made it very easy for weed control on many of our horticultural crops, but in the home garden we can't expect miracles. Now the Department of Agriculture can advise you in weed control in many situations, but in this edition of Green Fingers, I want to show you a number of alternative ways in which we can control our weeds and show you some of the situations where chemicals can be used safely. The hoe is still the most useful implement for the home garden, and with a little hand weeding, hoeing is the only safe way of keeping garden beds free of weeds 
where annuals, bulbs or other soft-leafed plants are grown. All these sites haven't got a place in our gardens. They have. But like all agricultural chemicals, they must be used in the right places and in the right way. Mix them according to the directions on the label. Always read this label. If necessary, wear protective clothing and measure the quantities out. Don't guess. The contact type weedicides, which give you a quick kill of the weeds, are the most suitable and safest to use. But there are many others available to home gardeners. If you have a special weed problem, contact the Victorian Department of Agriculture for more advice. Areas where weedicides are the most useful are along paths or driveways. A simple dribble bar attached to your watering can is an inexpensive way of applying the chemical. Walk over the area to be treated at an even pace to wet the weeds that are to be killed. Make sure that you wet them all, for those missed will continue to grow. Be careful not to splash the chemical onto the plants in garden beds or over the edge of the path onto the lawn. Along fence lines or open drains are other areas where weedicides can be useful to the home gardener. Perhaps a larger spray pump will be needed but when using a pressure pump try and keep the spray nozzle close to the weeds. Use a large droplet size for the spray and work with a low pressure. Okay, yep, there's a lot of stuff in there, so let's try and unpack some of it. And I know many of you have already uh, uh, typed little comments into the chat boxes, and so uh, that's just great. So the first one is, as they imply, go ahead and read the label, but I didn't see anything that would indicate that this chap actually did read the label. And then. Uh, I didn't really see him measure any of the pesticides, although you might say that he was measuring the pesticides in that uh, uh, cooking cup or measuring cup. But really, uh, I don't think that there was any time spent on measuring. And that brings me to a cooking cup. You should not be using anything that may end up uh, in, in a food purpose for uh, mixing or measuring pesticides. Uh, if you were to do so, you would want to make it clearly marked so that there's no way anybody uh, could pick that thing up and use that in, a, uh, in an actual food situation. So we don't recommend it. And if you did, I would uh, recommend that you highly mark it up. They didn't use any PPE. I mean, guy had bare arms. I uh, wasn't, you know, he says, well, if it says you need to wear some, then you should. And I think that uh, my friends at Washington State University did a really great job uh, demonstrating that you should always cover up and uh, at least wear a minimum handful of personal protective equipment for all pesticides, uh, whether it says so or not. Don't splash the mixture. My goodness, uh, that was a real no-no. Uh, I would hate uh, to be somebody who has uh, come upon that uh, faucet and uh, is, is getting some water or hooking up my hose and then stepping on or walking on those uh, that splashed mixture and then perhaps moving it to some other place in the yard or garden, that wouldn't be very good at all. He didn't pour the stuff very carefully. You'll notice as he was, he was pour, pouring it into his dispensing uh, uh, pan that he, he spilled probably six or seven ounces on the ground. Um, so, and, and in the watering can, that just, 
that just amazes me because, um, you know, using a watering can after a pesticide has been in it, especially a pesticide, is really a recipe for disaster. Um, and I would never encourage you to do anything like that. I can tell you that I'm very concerned about cross-contamination of different um, equipment at my home. And I actually have uh, a certain uh, spray uh, systems that, that have in big, bold letters, insecticide only, fungicide only, uh, herbicide only, uh, soil sterilant only. And I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but the fact of the matter is it's very easy to cross-contaminate equipment and end up da damaging things that you don't want damaged. He said to calibrate. I didn't see any of the calibration other than they wanted you to walk at a nice even pace. Um, that just uh, goes without saying, but apparently they're um, not having any of it in this video clip. The other one was is that the spray uh, nozzles that he was using, they were leaking all over the place. That's not something that's acceptable. Uh, it could da damage plants that end up getting those concentrated drips on it. Uh, and besides that, you're just not hitting the target the way you should. Those are just some of my observations. Um, and uh, these are things that, that jump out at me when I'm using uh, or, or looking at this video clip. So I just wanna give you a, a couple of things to think about. And, and the first one is, is that when you're working with pesticides, I think one of the things that would, would serve you best is, is, you know, obviously you've read the label, but right before you go out there and start actually making that application, just take some time to look at the first aid instructions in case for some reason there is a problem. It's a little hard to read first aid information after there's an emergency that's going on. Most all pesticide labels will include a phone number to a poison control center. And it would be well if you uh, found that number and if, if that's something that you could uh, write down and make available um, easily and quickly, uh, that would be a good thing. The other thing is, is, is especially noting what we call the EPA registration number. If, if you have to call a poison control center or the local doctor or the local clinic, if you have that EPA registration number, you can cut through so much um, uh, flailing around. Most all of these places have access to a database. And if they have that EPA registration number, they can pick up that label, look at it in their database, and, and explain to you exactly the best way to deal with that problem. So. Note the, uh, the poison control number and, and note the uh, EPA registration number. One other thing, uh, in the olden days, we used to have 911 registered to our homes, but so many people are using uh, cell phone technology now that not all of them are properly re registered to your location. So that's something that you might want to check into um, as a prelude to getting out and working with your pesticides this spring. Obviously, you need to have that label uh, readily available, but there is an additional companion uh, form called a safety data sheet that goes with all pesticide labels. This is sort of like an add-on. It's uh, good information. It's information that you can use if you are a firefighter or um, a, a first responder or a doctor or a nurse. The safety data sheet is not required uh, for application purposes, but it's something good to, to have on hand. And many of the manufacturers 
on their websites and even the North Dakota Department of Agriculture website has a uh, link to the safety data sheet in addition to the label. So think of the safety data sheet as uh, first aid instructions big time, uh, probably six, seven, eight pages of information about that chemical. So if you're using a chemical a lot, I'd recommend you get a hold of the safety data sheet. One of the things I want to focus in on before we go here is hygiene and decontamination. Now, this again was put together with, with my friends at Washington State University a couple of years ago. It's a very, very short clip. It's a satire. It's campy. It's stupid. But it does a very good job explaining the necessity for getting properly decontaminated at the end of the day, making sure that you're clean, uh, that you are not carrying pesticide residues on your body or on your work clothes. So let's go ahead and run with this video clip and we'll talk some more about it on the other side. Welcome to the show that makes you say, why are we watching this? The Decon Show. And here's your host, that zany, Bobo. Alrighty then, you know how this show works. We invite amateur entertainers to come on stage and perform. If the performance is terrific, our judges give them a score. If, on the other hand, their performance is awful, which usually happens, one of our terrific judges can put the hammer to them, sounding the alarm. Okay, our first contestant doesn't mind. She's a mixer loader who works for a nursery. I love you, Bobo! Okay. Hey, that wasn't nice. She didn't even get to start her act. Why'd you sound the alarm? Never hug someone when you could have pesticide residues on your clothing. I mean, she shouldn't be hugging anyone when she has residue on her coveralls. She needs to go home, shower, change her clothes, and then come in. You mean she could have exposed me? <laughs> Yikes! Okay, our next contestant is a turf ornamental applicator who surely must shower and change his clothes as soon as possible after pesticide application. So I'm going to go wash up. Take it away! The stage is all yours! Thanks, it's great to be here. <laughs> Judge number one, why'd you say on the alarm? Is it's clear he is wearing pesticide contaminated shoes. Look at the orange dye. You know, he could be spreading pesticide everywhere he steps. Let's go. Let's, let's pack it up. Hey! Well, our final contestant is a farm mechanic. Wow, you're clearly the winner! <laughs> Great job! That's right, Bobo. Clearly this contestant didn't expose us to pesticides. Yeah. That's right, Bobo. At work they asked me to repair a pesticide sprayer. I was very careful not to take pesticide residue home. When I got home, I left my boots outside. I took off the rest of my work clothes and kept them separate from the family laundry. Then I took a shower and changed into my fancy dancing clothes. Well, looks like our final contestant gets points for cleanliness. He did everything right. He cleaned his PPE at work, he left his shoes outside his house, he changed his clothes and made sure they wouldn't get mixed in with regular laundry, and he washed up. <laughs> Unfortunately though, we are out of time. So remember, you'll know if your bucket gets sick, because it'll look a little pale. <laughs> Good night everyone, and have a happy tomorrow. I know that's just, it's so campy, but it really does underscore the necessity for making sure that 
you are properly decontaminated and that you clean yourself well at the end of the workday. And if you want more information on that, we could spend uh, an entire uh, field to fork episode on laundering pesticide contaminated work clothes. But I offer this up for you. I know that Julie will make this available to you. Uh, this QR code will help you get to that website. And I think there's some really great tips there on how to manage your pesticide contaminated clothing and to uh, do a good job of getting them properly decontaminated. Uh, just disposal, if you've got some leftover uh, pesticides or pesticides that are uh, in out of condition, uh, we do have what we call Project Safe Sin in North Dakota, which is typically in July, and uh, they will uh, collect pesticides at no cost to you. They typically do that in, in July, and it will um, they'll have the dates and locations uh, set probably in the next month or so. So if you want to go to this QR code, uh, it'll take you directly to their website and you can get the latest information on that. I know other states have collection programs, and I would suggest uh, that if you're in a state outside of North Dakota, that you contact your uh, Department of Agriculture or Department of Natural Resources or Environment in your uh, respective state, and I'll bet you you'll find a similar program. We're going to wrap things up. And I just want to say that, you know, I always get this question, are pesticides safe to use? And, and as I mentioned at the top of this uh, presentation, all, all pesticides include risks. We can manage those risks. So we wear PPE, we only apply uh, materials uh, on the proper site or the proper crop. Uh, we spray when we're, when the wind is blowing away from a sensitive site, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you that when you don't apply the pesticides uh, within the boundaries of the label, it's not safe. It just isn't safe. And uh, that's why we spend so much time talking about reading and following the label. Now, I'm a pesticide specialist. So you're saying, wow, this guy must be really a pesticide aficionado, and actually I'm pretty lazy. Uh, sometimes uh, working with pesticides are a pain in the backside. So, so what I'll do is, is, is I'll, I'll try to figure out how to avoid using them unless I absolutely need them. And when I need them, then I'm gonna take the time to, uh, to do it right. Um, so sometimes it may be better to just not use pesticides if you can find other ways accomplish your goal without too much trouble. I have a picture of my two kids from about 15 years ago. They're all grown up now, but I can tell you that both of them applied pesticides professionally when they were adults. And that was how they helped pay for their college education. I'm very proud of them, but I'm also concerned about their welfare. And I can assure you that if we could not mitigate the risks associated with pesticides, I would have never recommended that they do that. It was a good experience for them. And they did take the time and they worked in, in places that valued the health of their employees such that um, all the risks were mitigated. And I'm thankful for that. And I just want to implore you, if you're going to use pesticides, do it the right way and do it in a way that mitigates the risks. That's really all I have for today. This is our non-discrimination statement. And I'll leave that with you for a moment or two. I'm going to bring up my video and I'm going to stop the share so I can answer a few questions that you might have. And you do have a few questions, Andrew. And first, thank you. That was that was really a helpful talk. I learned a lot. Um, your first question: Does seven dust get into plant roots system? And part B: Does it affect the finished vegetable? 
Boy, that is a really fantastic question. And the, and the seven dust get into the vegetable. And I would say, yes, it would, because it does have some systemic properties. Um, so it can be taken up by the root system and moved up into the plant. So if you've got a, a tuber or you've got uh, beans or peas or something like that, it's, it's going to be absorbed by the roots and moved. I'm not aware that seven is hugely systemic. But certainly uh, the label probably is going to direct you about being careful around uh, certain uh, food uh, crops. All right. The second question that came in, what is the best pesticide to always have in the home when gardening food or owning houseplants? Or in other words, what is Andrew's most used pesticide? Oh man, now you're really putting me on the spot. <laughs> you know, I have a, I have a lot of different favorites out there, and, and it really depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. So let's just say that I want to deal with uh, dandelions in the front yard. I'm probably going to go for a three or four way mixture of a uh, weed be gone. Uh, an ortho-based product, uh, something that's going to have three or four different active ingredients, including 2,4-D, M, uh, CPP, uh, dicamba, uh, sulfentrazone. Um, anyway, th that's one of my favorites for that. Glyphosate is really a great product uh, for controlling weeds uh, around the foundation of the house. Um, things like that, as long as you avoid um, getting it on uh, sensitive plants that, that you want to stick around. Insecticides are more complex. Um, you know, one of them that I like is, is called Tempo. The active ingredient is cyflutrin, relatively low toxicity. Doesn't mean that it's no toxicity. It's relatively low. And, um, I, and I tend to, to like that. But it, it's really... You know, those are just my, some of my favorites, I guess. All right. Well, your next question. Let's say you've properly made your pesticide. How long can you store a pesticide such as BT or spinosad? Oh, that's a really good, uh, really good question. So I'm, I'm assuming that um, they, they want me to talk about spinosad or BT products, right? Yes. Okay, so so first off, as long as they're not mixed with water and they're kept dry in a, in a cool environment, they, they're going to keep very long. Now, once you mix them with water, then at that point, uh, those, uh, those uh, compounds and those active uh, bacteria like the BT become activated, they're alive, uh, more or less. And so they're going to have a shelf life, and you're going to have to look at the label on there that tells you how long you can wait. Um, in general, I try not to mix up any more pesticides than I know that I'm going to use in, in one setting. And if I'm going to be a little bit on the short side, that's probably a good thing. I don't like stuff sitting in a spray tank for four or five or six days, it doesn't matter what pesticide it is. Um, it's better to not have any leftovers at the end of the spray job. So what if, uh, I'll ask a follow-up, what if you do have some leftover pesticide in your tank? How do you get rid of that? Well, obviously it depends on what pesticide and what site and all those sorts of things. If it was spinosad or BT, uh, you could probably uh, safe, safely spray it out on the site that it was intended for. You probably won't get any control, but at least you're going to get rid of the stuff and it's not going to be uh, uh, an issue in your garage. Now, there are other pesticides out there that you have to be much more careful about. Um, and in those certain circumstances, you would want to follow the label direction on spraying it on the site. So for instance, uh, glyphosate is a, a wonderful broad spectrum herbicide. Um, you know, I would spray it on my rocks uh, where I've got weeds poking through my riprap um, 
you know, because that's an intended site. And so uh, I may not get the control if it's been sitting in my garage for three or four or five days, but at least I've applied it to the, the site that it's it's properly registered for. Great, thank you. Um, there's someone online, Kathy, who must know you because she says, Andrew has specific sprayers for specific items. And he should mention that you may need a couple herbicide sprayers, one for broadleaf weeds and one for Roundup because of carryover. Example, you use it for Trimac on the lawn, then use it for Roundup in the garden. If you don't wash it correctly, you can potentially get Trimac in the garden. Do you agree with it, all that? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've got a lot of, uh, I, I think I've got four different one gallon sprayers uh, in the garage. And and uh, I have one that, you know, is, is an insecticide sprayer. Um, I have one that is for spraying soil sterilants. Uh, on the rock garden, uh, you know, when I, when I just want to kill everything. Um, but I would not want to use that sprayer uh, on my lawn um, because of the carryover. And so, yeah, I do have a broadleaf sprayer for, for the lawn. Um, so, yes, um, uh, of course you could, you know, if you did a really great job cleaning out the sprayer and you used, um, um, the right materials, um, bleach or ammonia or, or other recommended products, you could probably do a really good job getting it clean, but I'm too lazy for that. Most of you are as well. It's better to just have an extra device on the shelf. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one says, how long do pre-mixed pesticides last most of what i buy is ready to use yeah that's a great question um you know and it, again that depends on what it says for storage temperatures and and the conditions in which you store the chemicals so let's say that you do buy a ready to to use mixture that you would use to spray dandelions on your lawn uh, the vast majority of that is is water uh, and a very small fraction of it is uh, the actual active ingredient. Um, the likelihood that that stuff could be carried over in the wintertime in North Dakota is not very good, um, especially when you get uh, freeze-thaw cycles that we have. Um, and so you would need to look at the label, um, but probably it would not be something that you would want to carry over. Now, I do have some herbicides that do not have a minimum storage temperature, and I do I store them outside. And I've, I've stored these things for like seven or eight years and they work just fine, um, but they're designed to do that. It says it on the label. All right, so your final question and... Um... If you Google Andrew Thostenson, you can easily find his email, and I'm sure he would answer the other couple of questions that we won't have time to do. But your final question, how long does glyphosate last in the soil? Well, that's another great question. First of all, uh, glyphosate is what we call dirt-philic. In other words, it loves dirt. Um, and so when it gets exposed to the soil, it uh, it binds to the soil particles, okay? And so it binds so hard to those soil particles that it's subjected to uh, bacterial degradation uh, very quickly. And in fact, we have real problems when people apply uh, glyphosate in an agricultural situation in dusty conditions where we get dust on the plants and it renders the glyphosate inactive or we lose efficacy. So uh, I would not expect it to last very long in the soil at all, probably less than in than 24 hours, maybe within a matter of uh, an hour or two, but it just, it, it it's not, it's not a long-term residual pesticide in soil. 
there are pesticides that will stay in the soil for a very, very long time. They can be active uh, for a very, very long time, but glyphosate is not one of them. Well, I will draw us to a close because it is three o'clock and I want to thank Andrew for a great talk today. I learned a lot and I want to thank all of you for participating. And we have about six of these presentations left. So we hope you continue to join us and please do the survey when it shows up in your email. So thanks everybody. Thank you and uh, have a very safe and productive spray season. Mm -hmm.